Now, the most important 35-year-old in the history of Hollywood that you've never heard of. If you're not in the movie business, you probably never heard of the name Ryan Kavanaugh. I surely have, and so has everybody in Hollywood. Ryan Kavanaugh today is probably the most successful independent film producer and film company in the business. He's produced over 117 movies. He has made about $11.9 billion in box office. He has got 40 Oscar nominations for the films he's produced, probably 10 wins, 30 Golden Globes, and he's all done it at a very young age of? 21? <laughs> 35. 35. Um, the question is really, are you some kind of friggin' genius? How did you come out of nowhere and literally do this? It is unbelievable. Well, <laughs> I read this book called How to Do It in Hollywood <laughs> and got to the end. Are you serious? No. no. <laughs> uh, uh, that's it. I, how did I do it? Um, the idea when I started Relativity mm -hmm. was that there was a, a couple trends that were occurring. Number mm -hmm. one, the studios were starting to face mm -hmm. budget issues. Right. I mean, Really, there was, there was two trends happening. One, all the studios got consolidated, mm -hmm. so, you know, it was GE owned Universal mm -hmm. and Viacom owned Paramount and mm -hmm. News Corp owned Fox and so on and so forth. And Time Warner AOL was, was Warner Brothers. And I think, well, that, that was happening at the same time that there was a, a market that mm -hmm. the movie business relied heavily on, which was primarily this German, it was really a, not even a tax market, it was a, right. a, a German sale leaseback program. Right. And it was effectively a government program that was created for the German government, well, for German companies to allow for more capital to be infused into mm -hmm. German companies. It was set up for pharmaceutical companies. And some of these German guys found a loophole that was allowing them to actually invest into U.S. movies. And billions and billions of dollars yeah, yeah. were being used. It was funding, you know, 20, 30 percent of Hollywood's lights. Okay. And, you know, the kind of creation of relativity came from the fact that I looked at it and effectively went, one, you know, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to, to look at something and say, if a government creates a program to fuel their own economy and someone finds a loophole to get it all out into another country's economy, mm -hmm. they're going to stop it, right. which would mean there was going to be a shortfall of capital. And number two, I think the studios assumed when they got acquired that mm -hmm. a GE or a Viacom mm -hmm. <clears throat> or, you know, any of these large mm -hmm. uh, Fortune 100, in some cases, companies had massive balance sheet and would just give them all the money they needed. And I don't think they recognized that these companies are very fiscally conservative, meaning mm -hmm. that they, GE, you mean, GE you know, exactly, it. meaning that no matter how much money they have, they're not just going to say, "Okay, you need two billion." Here it is. They basically say, "We have 500 children. You, you know, Universal are one of them, and here's your check for, for the year. a billion dollars. And if you need more, go somewhere else." So, those two trends, you know, led me to kind of make the assumption that Hollywood is going to be in desperate need of capital, okay. and so. You know, the second step for me was I had had relationships with a lot of the, as a banker prior, with a lot of the guys that ran the studios, studios. and basically went to them and said, you're going to have a big issue soon where you're going to need mm -hmm. capital, and there's only one place you're going to get that amount of capital, which is Wall Street, mm -hmm. and I need access to these numbers so that I can effectively start building models mm -hmm. that if I believe what I'm saying is true, which is you've been in business for 100 years, you're profitable vir virtually every year, mm -hmm. you know, there's got to be a model that can look, breathe, smell, and act like and right. any other instrument Wall Street invests in. So I don't know if you, for those of you out there, if you heard this, he co-finances nine to ten movies of Sony's movies and nine to ten movies of Universal's movies every year, right? Yeah, we finance about 75% yeah. of their slate. 75% of all of Universal slate and 75% of all Sony's slate. And that is just a phenomenal accomplishment. But on top of that, you went and started making your own movies. And, and you bought Rogue, which, yep. which is an incredible brand. And I know you have big plans for that brand. And so, and where, talk about a little bit about Rogan and where it's going and what you want to do. Well, we were starting to make our own movies. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of studio quality movies that we were actually selling to these independent distributors. Okay. And at the time it was, New Line was servicing them with a lot of product. And then we were kind of the second guys. And then there was a mm -hmm. bunch of other guys giving them product. But um, effectively, what happened then was New Line all of a sudden went out of, you know, out of the foreign sales market because mm -hmm. they got swallowed up by Warners. Mm -hmm. And these independent distributors mm -hmm. were desperate for product. And so we basically um, made partnerships with all of them, similar mm -hmm. to what New Line did, but a lot larger and with a lot more territories. Mm -hmm. What Rogue really was for us was a step forward in let's start taking a little more of that control back and mm -hmm. building it in-house. Um, we've launched um, multiple Rogue sites mm -hmm. to allow a consumer to get much more involved and invested in mm -hmm. and interact with our film pro making process, our TV making mm -hmm. process, which no one's really done to date. Mm -hmm. And then we're launching out all the components of a lifestyle brand mm -hmm. with Rogue, really making it a brand that kids can associate mm -hmm. with, a brand that you know, kids know um, 
is a place that they can get involved in filmmaking. They can get involved in interacting with the talent. Mm -hmm. They can actually make changes, mm -hmm. you know, on films. They can watch, you know, yeah. if, when we do our movie, hopefully after Burn Together, and, yeah. you know, you're uh, on the set talking to the camera, and, you yeah. know, kids can say, hey, you know, I think you should do this. And if yeah. enough of them say it, you know, you actually go make that change, and it allows them to, to have like an influence. Process, yeah, yeah, well, they are part of the process. Yeah. Um, so will everything ultimately, what's going on? What is your plan as a company for 3D? What's happening? What's going on with 3D? Here's how we look at it. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that everything should be 3D. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily believe it should be 3D for 3D's sake. Meaning mm -hmm. there are examples of movies that came out very poorly mm -hmm. that they converted to 3D for 3D's sake. So what we're doing is we're looking at our movies mm -hmm. and figuring out what kind of on our slate really can, can have a value add from 3D. So we have Wes Craven's first movies directed in 10 years called My Soul to Take coming out on Halloween. And, you know, this will be Wes Craven's first 3D experience and it's a horror thriller, mm -hmm. you know, movie that you look at that and that, in my opinion, yeah. gets enhanced by the experience of the 3D. The story gets enhanced. Right. By the, by the but like our movie Catfish, yeah. you know, where it's a love story slash yeah. thriller over the internet that doesn't really have any of those things jumping out, yeah. you know, that 3D is going to be, it's a cheap trick that you try and get more ticket price. Last question then. Do you have a life? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I have um, a great girlfriend at home, and, uh, you know, I, I live on the beach, so I'm very lucky. I mean, the truth is, I love what I do. Yeah. I mean, I love it. It's not like work. I, I wake up I wake up in the middle of the night, and there's thoughts going through my brain, and, yeah. you know, I'm so lucky that I'm in a position where I can actually affect change to a yeah. business, and, you know, so, and I get to meet people like yeah. you, and, you know, we get to have fun and work travel together world, and travel the world. And I'm happy to know you and happy to be in business with you. Thanks, Brett. You right, make buddy. me cry. <laughs> <laughs>